Good afternoon and welcome to the Downing Street press conference. I'm joined this afternoon by Dr Jenny Harris, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer. As Housing Secretary, I'm going to set out our comprehensive plan to safely restart, reopen and renew the housing market. But first, I want to update you on the latest data on the coronavirus response. 2,094,209 tests for coronavirus have now been carried out in the United Kingdom, including 87,063 tests carried out yesterday. 229,705 people have tested positive. That's an increase of 3,242 cases since yesterday. 11,327 people are in hospital with COVID-19, down 15% from 13,273 cases last week. And sadly, of those tested positive for coronavirus across all settings, 33,186 have now died. That's an increase of 494 fatalities since yesterday. These figures include deaths in all settings, not just in hospitals. Before turning to the housing market, I want to remind people of how we will address this phase of our fight against COVID-19. Firstly, and if we could turn to the first slide, thank you. In order to monitor our progress, we're establishing a new COVID alert level system with five levels, each relating to the level of threat posed by the virus. The alert level we base primarily on the R value and the number of coronavirus cases. And in turn, that alert level will determine the level of social distancing measures in place. The lower the level, the fewer the measures. The higher the level, the stricter the measures. The social distancing measures remain critical in our efforts to control the virus. Throughout the period of lockdown, which started in March the 23rd, we've been at level four, meaning a COVID-19 epidemic is in general circulation and transmission is high or rising exponentially. Thanks to the hard work and the sacrifices of the British people in the lockdown, we've helped to bring the R level down now that we are in a position to begin moving to level three, we will do so in time in careful steps. If we turn to slide two, we've set out the first of three steps we'll take to carefully modify the measures and gradually ease the lockdown and begin to allow people to return to their way of life, but crucially, doing so while avoiding what would be a disastrous second peak that could overwhelm the NHS. After each step, we will closely monitor the impact of that on the R and the number of infections, and all the available data will be used, and we'll only take the next step when we're satisfied that it's completely safe to do so. The first step from this week will be as follows. Those who cannot work from home should now speak to their employer about going back to work. You can now spend time outdoors and exercise as often as you like. You can meet one person outside your household in an outdoor public place, provided that you stay two metres apart. The second step from the 1st of June at the earliest, as long as the data allows, we will aim to do the following primary schools to reopen for some pupils in smaller classes, non-essential retail to start to reopen when and where it's safe to do so, cultural and sporting events to take place behind closed doors without crowds. And then step three, no earlier than the 4th of July, and again, only if the data says it's safe to do so, we aim to allow the following, more businesses and premises to open, 
including potentially those offering personal care, such as leisure facilities, public places, and places of worship. And on that last point, I've been speaking to faith leaders and will convene later this week a task force to establish when and how places of worship can open safely for some of the practices uh, where social distancing can take place, such as private prayer, potentially private prayer being able to be carried out earlier than July the 4th. Many of these businesses and organisations will need to operate in new ways to ensure that they're safe and we will work with those sectors and individuals on how to do this. If we turn to the third slide, having taken the first step in carefully adjusting some of the measures and our advice to people on what to do, we've also updated what we are asking people to do, which is to stay alert, to control the virus and to save lives. For many people, the appropriate course still means staying at home as much as possible. But there are a range of other actions we're advising people to take when they do go out to work or for other activities. Limiting contact with other people, keeping distance when you do go out, two metres apart wherever possible, washing your hands regularly, wearing a face covering when you're in an enclosed space where it's difficult to be socially distant, for example, in some shops or on public transport. And if you or anyone in your household has symptoms, you all need to self-isolate. This slide sets out some of the activities you can now do. And as I'll come on to later, you'll see that you can now move house. On the fourth slide, if everyone stays alert and follows these rules, we can control coronavirus by keeping the R down and reducing the number of infections. This is how we will continue to save lives and livelihoods and we can begin as a nation to recover from coronavirus. And as we begin to recover, it's essential that we cautiously open up parts of our economy where it's safe to do so. Now, earlier today in Parliament, I made a statement setting out our clear, coherent and comprehensive plan to restart, reopen and renew the housing market and our construction industry. I'm sure this will be of interest to many people at home who are hoping to move house and I'd like to set out what this means in more detail. From today, anyone in England can move house if they follow the new guidance that we've published on gov.uk. When the lockdown was announced in March, we changed the rules so that people could only move home if they thought it was reasonably necessary. That meant that more than 450,000 buyers had to put their plans on hold. And each month, 300,000 tenancies come up for renewal as well. A significant proportion of these will result in people needing to or wanting to move home. The pressure to move for some was becoming acute with serious legal and financial and health implications. During an already difficult time, these people have been stuck in limbo. Now they can carry on with their house moves and add some certainty to their lives. So from today, estate agents' offices can reopen, viewings, whether virtual or in-person, are permitted, show homes can open, and removal companies and the other essential parts of the sales and the lettings process are restarted with immediate effect. For most people, moving home is not a luxury. People decide to move home because their personal circumstances change. The changes that I've announced today are happening safely in order to control the virus and to protect the public. We've published very detailed guidance informed by public health advice to explain how this can be achieved with all parties 
observing hygiene measures and social distancing guidelines. People have asked, why would they be able to look around a stranger's home but not visit their parents or loved ones at home? Now, I understand why this may seem confusing at first glance, especially when people have been separated from their loved ones for so long. But our guidelines make clear that in the first instance, viewings should happen virtually. When viewings do happen in person, we've set out a clear plan to ensure the safety of everybody involved in the property itself. Those considering moving in and the estate agents and letting agents. These requirements include visits being by appointment only, open house viewings should not be taking place, and speculative viewings where buyers or tenants are not serious yet are highly discouraged. All parties should follow strict social distancing guidelines. All internal doors should be opened where possible. The current occupier should vacate the property for the duration of the visit, going out for their daily exercise, going out to the shops or standing in the garden if that's possible. All involved in the process should wash their hands upon entering the property and once the viewing has taken place, all the surfaces in the property, including the door handles, should be thoroughly cleaned. There are, of course, exceptions. For those who are self-isolating or have coronavirus, they should not be moving or going back to work or allowing tradespeople or professionals into their home. Where this is the case, all parties involved in house buying or selling should prioritise amicable, sensible arrangements to change the move dates for the individuals concerned. That's been happening across the country in recent weeks and it will need to continue. We would also ask those who are clinically vulnerable and those who are shielding to consider very carefully their personal situation and to seek personal and specific medical advice before deciding whether to commit to or to proceed with moving home. If you're in this situation, and you decide that you must go ahead, all professionals involved should be made aware so that they can put in place any additional precautionary measures to provide further protection for your health and further legal protection to make sure that the transaction goes as smoothly as can be expected. A vibrant housing market means more than buying and selling homes. We need to get building again, and Britain needs that. It's something that this government has always been committed to, something that our ambitious First Homes programme will do later this year with a 30% discount on new homes for key workers, including nurses and teachers and police officers, as well as local first-time buyers. We want them to be ready as soon as possible, and that's just one of the reasons why I'm keen to get construction up and running. To help with this, I'm today announcing further steps to support safe house building by allowing more flexible working hours on construction sites where it's appropriate and with local uh, consent. I'm allowing sites to apply to extend their working hours, again with immediate effect, to 9pm Monday to Saturday in residential areas and beyond that in non-residential areas and setting out a very clear government position that these applications should be approved by local councils unless there are very compelling reasons not to do so. Varied start and finish times will make it much easier for sites to observe social distancing, take the pressure off public transport like the Tube in London and keep Britain building. There are countless examples of the industry behaving responsibly and proactively during this pandemic. I'd like to thank today Taylor Wimpy, who have now got construction safely underway on the majority of their sites and have started removing staff from the furlough scheme and getting back to work on full pay. They are offering a discount of 5% for NHS staff and care workers on new homes, a great way to recognise the contribution that our frontline heroes are making across the country. So thank you to them. It's also time 
that the planning system makes more use of digital technology to operate remotely and efficiently during this pandemic. I'm determined that the planning inspectorate is at the forefront of this work and I welcome the inspectorate now undertaking its first ever virtual hearings. I'm asking them to make all hearings virtual within weeks so the planning system can resume and be made more permanently accessible and user-friendly. This is the most comprehensive restarting of an industry in the first phase of our roadmap. With few, if any, transactions, there is no visibility and no precedent with which to accurately judge the state of the housing market. But history tells us that in every economic recovery in modern British economic life, the housing market has been key to recovery and revival. As Housing Secretary, I will do everything I can to support the millions of people employed in the construction and the housing industries to help their sector bounce back whilst always prioritising their safety and well-being. Almost 100 separate organisations have already signed up to the Charter for Safe Working Practice, pledging that they will share the responsibility to ensure that their sites operate safely and in accordance with government advice. I'd like to thank all of those who've signed and encourage the whole industry to join them. Today, we reopen, we restart, and we renew the housing market and the construction industry to protect lives, to save jobs, and to begin rebuilding our economy. Thank you. I'll now hand over to Dr. Harris. Jenny. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to run through some of the slides um, which show uh, how we've been doing as a nation in uh, managing social distancing. Uh, this slide represents the changes in our transport use. Uh, it's compared to uh, traffic and buses from uh, earlier in the year usage and rail from last year. And you can see that all of the different types of transport, uh, the uh, reduction in use has been more than 50%, except, of course, in our heavy goods vehicles, which are transporting uh, essential uh, items for us. And it's important for us to watch that. It's been a, a real strong indicator of how successful the social distancing policy has been. And that has obviously translated through to a reduction in the number of infections that we've seen uh, and the pressures on our hospitals. Uh, and we'll be monitoring that continuously as we go forward. Next slide, please. Um, this slide shows the current situation on uh, testing and new cases. Um, the testing, so as at 9 o'clock this morning, uh, 87,063 tests were completed in the previous 24 hours, uh, and that brings the total of tests uh, that have been completed to uh, well over 2 million. Um, we have capacity well over that, and that will take us forward into uh, supporting our uh, testing in uh, particular uh, hotspots, uh, so care homes and in hospitals where we want to uh, ensure we have maximal capacity, but absolutely increasingly with our test and trace programme. Uh, so having that uh, capacity there will allow us to go forward as the number of cases drop. And we can see in the bottom half of the slide uh, the number of confirmed cases. Uh, so just in the con cases confirmed uh, on the 13th of May, 3,242. Um, again, 229,705 uh, cases confirmed in total. Of course, we, we recognise that not all cases will be counted here. These are laboratory confirmed cases. But even so, as our testing capacity has increased, we can see that the number of confirmed cases continues to decrease. And that's a very positive sign as we move forward. Next slide, please. Uh, so this slide represents the uh, current information uh, from our hospitals. Uh, it's collected slightly differently across the UK nation. So in the top half of the slide, uh, you can see that the number of admissions uh, on the 11th of May was 711. And if we look at the week before that, that's down from just under 1,000. So again, a continuous downward trend in hospital admissions. 
clearly it's still important that we recognise there are a significant number of people uh, getting ill and needing support in our hospitals. That represents huge amounts of work still on the front line for healthcare workers. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a positive trend, but it's a, a slow one, and we need to ensure that social distancing uh, continues through this next phase of the plan. And on the bottom half of the slide, again, uh, the fewer patients who are coming into hospital, it's the proportion of the sickest, uh, the sickest numbers of, of those patients who then go on to need critical care beds. Um, and uh, that, you can see in all of the nations, has decreased uh, over the period. You can see the epidemic curve. Uh, but I think particularly important where we have been concerned previously as we were rising up that curve about capacity to deal with critical care, uh, just 21% of critical care beds are occupied with COVID patients. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, it's important to recognise that although there is some variation across the country, everywhere we can see that there has been a peak and there is now um, a plateau and a general trend downwards. Uh, London clearly uh, had a, a significant peak and in other areas the shape of that curve is flatter. It does mean that, again, we need to keep really careful about social distancing and applying uh, all the control measures to manage the virus uh, as we go forward. Uh, but nevertheless, you can see that uh, 11,327 people in hospital, and that's down from uh, more than 2,000, or just about 2,000 uh, higher than that last week. So a continuous trend downwards. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is the, the last slide. Um, so these are the confirmed deaths from every, uh, every uh, uh, part of the system, not just hospital deaths. Uh, so sadly, there have been 494 uh, tests confirmed with a positive laboratory test uh, in the last 24 hours and 33,000 uh, overall. But again, you can see that uh, reflection of the downward trend uh, carrying on uh, as we go forward. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jenny. Well, our first question comes from a member of the public and it's from Michael, who is in London. I'm one of the many thousands of people working within the theatre and performing arts industries. It is clear it will be many months before theatres reopen and customers feel comfortable enough to come again. Will the government pledge to protect these industries that will be without any income for quite some time? Well, a very good question from Michael. Um, and I think all of us who care about the arts um, are very concerned for the future of theatres, uh, museums and galleries, performing arts, all of those who work in this sector, uh, which is incredibly important to the UK, one of our great international strengths um, and something that's important for uh, our well-being as well as a country uh, and as individuals. We have made available the unprecedented economic support package uh, that the Chancellor has brought forward to many of the organisations within the arts. Um, and so the furlough scheme, for example, which is paying part of the wages of millions of our fellow citizens today, is available to uh, some of those organisations. For those people who are self-employed, uh, there's also uh, the uh, Treasury scheme there, which uh, launched today, and so I would uh, refer self-employed people working within the arts to that if it's applicable to them. And the Culture Secretary is also working very closely with our main cultural institutions to see how we can guide them through undoubtedly a very difficult period of time and to put in place the social distancing guidelines so that they are ready to reopen uh, when the science and the medical opinion allows. And as you'll see from the roadmap that we've set out, uh, we hope that that will be later this summer, but it is very conditional upon continuing to keep the rate of infection down and continuing to control the virus, of which, of course, we've all got an important part to play. The second question is from Laura, who is from Rossendale. And Laura asks, there was a lot of talk about people being able to meet up in, fa meet up in family clusters or bubbles. Where are, uh, when are we likely sorry, to see this put in place? Well, the guidance that we've set out uh, in this first phase doesn't uh, propose that. It says that 
you can go out uh, more, you can exercise in public places. And when you're out in those public settings like parks, for example, you can meet up with one person from outside of your family as long as you maintain social distancing. So you can sit on a park bench or you can go for a walk talking to them as long as you're two metres apart. I don't know if Jenny, you want to, is there anything you'd like to say about um, what the longer term yes, trajectory I, might be for meeting up with family members? I, I mean, just to say it's a very important uh, public health issue as well, not simply from the control of infection perspective, but because we do recognise that uh, people who, particularly those who've been on their own or who um, are uh, isolated from others, would very much welcome this. It will be a very strong positive mental health boost, I think, quite apart from anything else. Uh, but it does get quite complicated, um, and uh, I don't want to run the risk of going back to some of my other uh, social advice, but uh, there are, it gets, to make it a very fair intervention and consistent with public health advice, it can get quite technical. So, for example, if you you have uh, families with large numbers uh, already in their families who want to meet up, you end up effectively with quite a large gathering, even if it's just two families meeting. Um, and I think it's really important that we think through the implications of that, um, particularly across families in different circumstances. If your family is a long way away, for example, you may be less able to do that. Um, but recognise what the benefits will be, I think, for uh, individuals, and we are able to put in uh, public health advice to some of those decisions. Thanks, Jenny. Now, the first question from a uh, member of the media is Laura Koonsberg from the BBC. Good afternoon, Laura. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Secretary of State. Um, why is it that the government can't seem to get a grip on the crisis in care homes? And Dr Harris, could I ask you, is it right for some hospitals to be trying to persuade care homes to take in patients who have tested positive for the virus? Well, thank you, Laura. Care homes are at the absolute heart of all the work that we're now doing across government. It's essential that we provide them with the support that they need and deserve. Today, the Prime Minister announced a further £600 million of financial support that will be given to councils and flow through to care homes so that they can uh, fund the changes that we're asking them to do, which will include better infection control within care homes, uh, bringing that up to the highest standards if they're not doing so already, ensuring there's less rotation of staff, particularly agency workers, between care homes so we can shield those care homes that haven't had outbreaks as much as we possibly can, ensuring that there are named contacts within councils and the NHS for each care home, particularly the smaller care homes, the smaller independent care homes who might have uh, traditionally less uh, connection with their local council, ensuring that they're getting the support that they need uh, to put in place all of those measures. Obviously continuing to ensure that they get the uh, personal protective equipment that they need and the testing both for residents and for uh, care workers, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic. And we're using all of the levers that we have in the testing infrastructure to make that as accessible as possible, whether it's giving them privileged access to testing through their employers and also ensuring that the mobile testing units that we have in many cases uh, operated by the Ministry of Defence, are going to places that are convenient for care homes, in, in some cases to their own car parks, so that the staff are getting the tests that they need. Jenny. Thank you. Um, so you ask a very important question about um, effectively good infection prevention control when patients are moving and obviously uh, many of the elderly care home residents will be uh, some of our most vulnerable patients. Really important to remember that uh, if a patient has gone into hospital, been tested positive uh, at an early phase they, and have had the disease and recovered, they will still be marked as a positive test, but very unlikely to be infectious after a, a, a long period of convalescence in hospital. So I think we're not talking about that. Um, but what's really important in this, the test is, is an important element, but it is about the systems of good infection control, both in the hospital and in the receiving care home, and that is the fundamental basis, whether it be COVID or anything else, of managing patients carefully. The same sorts of issues arise to a degree with uh, in flu and with norovirus, which we'll be aware of. Uh, but I think here, although uh, every um, care, potential care resident, new moving care resident, uh, is tested, uh, now in hospitals, uh, there is an important element here. One is 
Even prior to that testing, there was a policy whereby uh, an individual who was moving into a care home would be retained, if you like, in safe isolation within the care home uh, because it was recognised that this was a, a risk group. So they are all having a test now, but they would have been treated in much the same way for quite a few weeks before this. Um, but I think uh, it does come down to a degree of local discretion. I know uh, NHS England colleagues have sent out very clear instructions to hospitals to support the testing, to make sure that's done in a convenient time period before the uh, patient is due for discharge, um, and to have local conversations about this uh, where on occasion, and I think it is not the rule, uh, there are difficulties. Clearly, at the centre of all of these discussions is often a very elderly and quite vulnerable individual, and it's really important that they are managed in the way which is best for their health and everybody else's infection risk, uh, but also their personal life as well. Thanks, Jane. Laura, do you, do you have a follow-up question? Uh, yes, I mean, you've listed some of the actions that the government's announcing today, um, but we are now two months since the first case was recorded in a care home and there aren't enough tests, there isn't still enough kit we hear from care homes around the country. Care home managers are desperately worried about what's going on. You know, why does it seem day after day that the government is not getting a grip on this? Well, I don't underestimate the challenge being faced by residents and staff of care homes. The package of support that we're giving today builds on the work that we've been doing for many weeks now with respect to PPE, for example, we've delivered tens of millions of items of PPE to care homes through local resilience forums across the country. Testing has been going on for some time. It, there's sure, there, I'm sure there is more that we can do, but we've now brought capacity for testing nationally up to 110,000, and we need to ensure that it's focused on the people who need it the most, including the care home workers. There is more that we can do, and our whole focus now needs to be on ensuring that care homes are guided through the weeks and months ahead and we protect as many people as we possibly can within them. Thanks, Laura. Uh, the next question is from Paul Brand from ITV. Good afternoon, Paul. Good afternoon, thank you. Any extra money for care homes is, of course, welcome money, but the funding you've announced today, as you outlined, is specifically for infection control. Care homes are telling us that sadly one of the greatest costs they face from COVID-19 is that many of their beds are now empty. How does this money prevent care homes from closing? Well, the £600 million that we're announcing today will help care homes to implement some of the further measures that we're announcing in the support package that's being published. And that will be focused on infection control, as you say, and also around helping them to reduce the amount of rotation of staff uh, between care homes. But it builds upon £3.2 billion of funding that we've given in the last two months to local councils, the vast majority of which, 90% of which, has gone to those councils with responsibility for adult social care. So there's almost £4 billion of additional funding that's been given to councils to help them meet the very significant additional costs that they're facing to do the things that we've asked of them to meet the challenge of coronavirus. We're obviously working very closely with those councils and with the care sector. And if there's further funding that's required, then obviously we'll consider that in the weeks and months ahead. We need to ensure they have the support, which is partly financial, but it goes beyond that as well. And the package includes ensuring that care homes, including those smaller independent homes, also have expert advice from councils, uh, from public health professionals and from the NHS to ensure they've got the best infection control, access to testing, the right pr uh, protective equipment and are making use of the new discharge policies so that residents are only uh, arriving or returning at the home once we know that they're free of COVID-19. I don't know if Jenny, there's anything you'd like to add on the package that we're bringing forward for Yes, for I mean, just from a, from a clinical perspective, um, uh, NHS England uh, already had a plan uh, of enhanced support uh, 
uh, for care homes in progress, but in fact that has been brought forward um, and there's a lot of joint working to ensure that uh, each care home, that there is a clinical lead in each area who can then uh, oversee and provide specialist advice. And I know, um, I, I don't have the figures here, but there's been a lot of training the trainers, for example, around infection control, which is an important element, um, and directors of public health who are very critical in local authorities. They will work between uh, the adult social care directors and between local public health teams uh, will be increasingly taking a leading role in in, uh, oversight of that. Many of them are already, but I think it's just pulling all these things together gives that added assurance that uh, there is consistency across the patch. But I, I think, um, going back to the earlier point, these are all elements that were uh, generally in place, so every uh, care home has an infection control policy. Um, it's, it's an added focus to it, though, and I think uh, we do recognise in some uh, smaller care homes, for example, it can be quite difficult to maintain specialist skills. So having this extra clinical support and advice going in uh, or available to people is a really important step. Thanks. Are you content with that, Paul, or do you have a follow-up question? Just a, just a quick one. I mean, as you know, uh, Community Secretary, some of the funding isn't getting through to care homes. It's not being passed on by councils. Councils say they haven't got enough money and the money you've announced today is specifically for infection control wouldn't it be better to allow the care homes to spend the money on whatever they need to spend the money on because some of them are closing we reported last night on one which has now moved residents out of out of the care home. well we want to ensure that care homes are financially sustainable uh, through this crisis uh, and that's why we've given the 3.2 billion pounds so far and now this additional 600 million pounds Councils are under a lot of pressure and we're asking a lot of them to do a whole range of tasks to support us in the national effort at the moment. But it is essential that they get that money through to the front line as quickly as possible. And we're going to be making sure this £600 million gets to care homes as quickly as we possibly can so that it can help them to put in place some of the important measures that we've just talked about. Thanks very much, Paul. Our, our next question is from Andy Bell from Channel 5. Andy, good afternoon. Oh, we, I don't think we can hear you, um, Andy, I'm afraid. You might, be, you might have muted yourself. I'll try again. Thanks, Andy. Can you hear me now? Great. We can. Mr Jenrick, the, the government has said that parents will not be penalised if they choose not to send their children back to school because they're worried. Will the same apply to staff if they are concerned about what is happening in schools next month, or will they simply be expected to go back to work? And Dr. Harris, uh, do you agree with the Prime Minister today that it's premature to have international comparisons on death rates? And if so, what has changed since you were happy to stand at that podium and make those comparisons in recent weeks? Well, thank you, Andy. Well, the, the Education Secretary is working very closely with the trades unions, with teaching professionals, to ensure that they are comfortable and have sufficient guidance to return to the workplace. Many teachers have been working, of course, uh, in those schools that have remained open, ensuring that the children of key workers and uh, vulnerable children are given uh, schooling during the lockdown measures. And we're very grateful to those teachers for doing that. But we're going to keep on working with the trades unions to provide as much comfort as we possibly can with a view to getting schools open uh, as quickly as possible in the, towards the timetable that the Prime Minister set out at the weekend. Jenny. Thank you. Um, so I think you're referring for, for viewers' benefits to uh, a slide, the slide set has changed slightly. Um, uh, I, as a scientist, uh, as a professional, um, I work on a basis of transparency of data. I'm absolutely delighted to discuss uh, death statistics comparisons uh, over uh, on whatever occasion is necessary. But I think um, there is no reason why uh, the death data can't be produced here and it's available uh, in public. There are a number of new reports, actually, which I think are adding insight. And so it's becoming uh, very clear that there are a lot of facets to understanding death data. So, for example, uh, the Office for National Statistics data, um, a number of reports coming through which the public can have access to uh, and look at those. So I think there is no suggestion that the death data cannot be available, uh, and, and it is in a number of different places. 
the main point, I think, of your question was around uh, comparisons. And you will know that I have stood here very often, but I think a whole range of other professionals, Chief Scientific Advisor, uh, Chief Medical Officer, um, uh, Sir Ian Diamond as well, and highlighted some of the risks of doing this. So I think all of us professionally are very clear that because death data is collected in very different ways in different countries, particularly at the moment, because the rate of testing is very different and because we're still understanding the risks to different strata of the population, so by age uh, or by other risk variables, the only really uh, good comparison in the longer term overall will be to look back at all-cause mortality, so that's a death from any cause at all, whether it be confirmed or not, um, and look at that um, when it's adjusted for age of a population. That accounts for whether a particular country has a very high proportion of older people and therefore expect more deaths, uh, but also to be seasonally adjusted as well, if possible. Because we know, for example, in, in normal times when we don't have COVID, that we will see excess deaths through a flu season. So all of those things are important. We're not quite there yet. And in fact, the pandemic is still moving at different times in different countries. So the time to do this on an international scale will be to look back probably 12 months hence still, uh, and then do the comparison. It's always good to keep looking on the way and to see if you can learn and we do that. Uh, but uh, that's the time I think to do it and it will be all cause mortality. Thank you. And Andy, would would you like to follow up on either of those questions? Yes, Mr. Jenrick. I mean, do you especially, Mr. Jenrick, understand why people might find it a little strange that that particular slide and those comparisons have disappeared at this point? Well, we, we want to be as transparent as we possibly can. We believe that the way that we now report deaths is amongst the most clear and transparent of any advanced country. We record deaths in all settings. And as Jenny has said, um, making international comparisons is very difficult uh, to do with accuracy at this moment in time. That doesn't mean that it's not worthwhile and that there aren't lessons to be learned from our performance and how it appears to uh, relate to those of other countries. But accurate, predict uh, accurate um, comparisons will be for the months to come when we're able to look at that measure of um, excess uh, deaths in the way that Jenny's just set out and that that day isn't isn't now but we'll keep on reporting the statistics as transparently as we can and the the new slides that you've seen this evening um, set out some further measures that I think will be very interesting for the public thank you very much Andy and the, the next question is from Gordon Rayner from the Telegraph good afternoon Gordon thank you <clears throat> thank you Secretary of State um a question for Dr. Harris uh, on schools. Uh, the, the French government has said that children are safer uh, at school than they are at home. Um, and I just wondered if Dr. Harris might be able to tell us, statistically speaking, um, which is more dangerous for children, uh, being in school at the moment or the journey to school, whether it's on foot or by public transport or by car. Um, and just a question for you, Secretary of State. We reported in the Daily Telegraph this morning that the Treasury is working on the assumption that um, coronavirus will increase the deficit to £337 billion pounds this year. Um, at this stage, has the government ruled out any of the possible ways of funding this, such as uh, tax increases, scrapping the triple lock on pensions or a public sector pay freeze? Well, let me answer, Gordon, that last question before turning to Jenny. Uh, those are matters for the Chancellor, and uh, he will no doubt return to some of those questions in future uh, fiscal events if he wishes. But he was very clear yesterday that coronavirus is having a profound impact upon the economy here in the UK as it is in economies all over the world. Uh, you're seeing people losing their jobs, you're seeing stress and harm to businesses large and small. The unprecedented measures that we've brought forward from the furlough scheme uh, to the bounce back loans, the C-bill loans and so on, are all designed to protect as many people and businesses as we possibly can. We know we won't be able to protect everyone and everyone's business, but we'll do as much as we can and we'll stand behind as many people and businesses as it's possible to do. It is important that where it's safe to do so, we do begin to cautiously reopen and restart aspects of the economy. And today I've announced a very significant step in that direction 
with the reopening of the housing market. And that, I hope, is an example of how we can safely get more people back to work and ensure the economy starts to get going again. Jenny. Thank you. Um, you. You actually gave quite a broad question, I think. I'm presuming it's in relation to uh, coronavirus as well as uh, the, the other issues. Uh, and I can't comment, I'm not particularly familiar with the French school system, apart from knowing that they probably have slightly different age groups and uh, day timing. So um, I, I think the important point here is uh, where, where are children going to flourish and to balance out those risks and opportunities. Um, and I think it's really important not just to think about infection control, uh, which is our prime conversation often these days, and risk of disease transmission, but also about some of the wider public health issues. So vulnerable children uh, particularly uh, are benefited hugely from uh, being at school and having a, a safe environment uh, there, and obviously that schooling has continued. Uh, equally important that children at particular phases of their education don't miss out because in terms of health risks, if a child in uh, early years uh, doesn't grasp the basics of education and feels comfortable in that environment, actually you can predict that their whole life chances, uh, their economic prosperity, and that based largely on their ability to uh, move into uh, healthy, good, employed work will affect their long-term health. So I think we shouldn't just be thinking of what is happening this minute but what happens over a child's lifetime and how important that is. Um, and then in terms of uh, risk of transmission, um, in some, there are a few other um, scenarios where infectious disease is quite interesting because the school environment is quite controlled. Uh, and actually, when children are at home, uh, they potentially behave in different ways. And it can be uh, in when social distance isn't, isn't around, obviously, uh, they can mix more. And so the balance of risk is not as clear either often with a child at home or at school. So a number of issues there. We do know that that overall children uh, appear to have less uh, well, we know they have less severe disease. We can see that uh, from the, the data. Uh, and they're certainly not transmitting this disease any more than adults do. Um, there's some indication that younger children particularly uh, are, are, if you like, a, a safer group. Um, and that is coming out and I think reflected in a number of European school policies. But I think your other point was around uh, getting to school as well. Um, and the modelling that's been done, one of the critical features is not just about the disease risk and transmission, uh, actually the really important thing is the social behaviours of the children when they get to school. So for younger children they tend to be closer, staying in their own areas, potentially walking uh, or being buggied to school. Um, for older children, uh, teenagers, they're tending to move across boundaries, uh, using a lot of public transport, that sort of thing. So I think you know, there are other great opportunities here as well. Um, there are really good opportunities for children to get good health benefits from uh, school walking buses rather than an actual school bus. So really long, quest, uh, long question, long answer, uh, but I think needs to be a really balanced one and thinking not just about our risks now, but balancing those with the risks of the child's whole future. Thanks, Jenny. Does that comprehensive answer from Jenny answer your question, Gordon, or would you like to come uh, back? It does. I was, I, the only thing I was going to ask you, Secretary of State, was it, if the if the schools don't reopen on June the 1st, as some of the unions um, are, are asking, how much of an effect that will have on your plans for economic recovery? Well, I think it is important for schools to return when it's, when it's safe to do so. Um, anyone who is a parent knows uh, the challenges of homeschooling and so on, and it's important that we get children back into the school setting for all the reasons that Jenny's set out. Um, but we will keep working with the trades unions. Our door is always open to them. And Gavin Williamson, the Education Secretary, will do everything he can to reach an agreement with them so that staff can feel comfortable in the workplace, which is absolutely right. Thank you. Our next question is from Dominic Eatman from Metro. Dominic, good afternoon. Hello, Secretary of State. Um, care homes were told until March the 13th that it was, quote, very unlikely that any of their residents would become infected. And only on that date were they advised to review their visiting policies. Did you neglect the risk to the care sector and prioritise the NHS at the expense of the old? Well, thank you, Dominic. I think Jenny can set out how an outbreak is managed and how discharge and testing policies have been developed over time, which I think is the heart of your question. Sure. 
Shall I explain that, and then you could you can come back? I mean, I think it's really important that uh, uh, there is an understanding of how a public health incident is managed. So whether it be COVID nineteen or, or any other issue, uh, there is a, a relationship between the local health protection team, who will always uh, advise on outbreaks and work with local health and care systems to do that. So. Um, if a case arose through that uh, any any symptomatic individual would have been assessed if it looks as if there is uh, an outbreak although we're doing much more testing now with more knowledge of the disease that's grown over the last few weeks uh, it would be normal policy to start with to test uh, say up to five uh, residents symptomatic residents once you can identify uh, what the disease is, we're talking COVID here, but it might be flu another year, uh, then it's easier to understand uh, what the proportion of uh, illness is in that care home. So uh, it's not just, it goes back to a point I made earlier in this briefing, it's not just about the testing or the discharge policy, it's about the systems of care that are in place. This is the fundamental building uh, fundamental building blocks of managing infectious disease in a care home but I think in the context of the point you were making um, throughout this uh, outbreak and it would be the same for any other we look at the background epidemiology of disease um, and I think the document referred to is a public health England document they will be monitoring background disease um, and so that document will be looking at where we knew there was a background risk of a uh, transmission so if it's sustained community transmission uh, then it's at that point that you might expect cases to be appearing in uh, other environments and the same applies you step up the alert system and then step it back down again obviously we're still we're still at the top now um, and I think in between that time and now there have been a number of different steps so the point I made earlier about advising discharge uh, into uh, an isolation period for an elderly person is another example uh, of that particular management of care. So I think it, it needs to be taken in the background of what the epidemiology was at the time of the incident or the advice, and that will apply to any documents which Public Health England has produced. And I think at that time we, ha we did not uh, recognise there was any sustained community transmission. We clearly had... Uh, cases around. Okay, thank you. Dominic. Uh, yeah, um, just on that, Keir Starmer pointed out today that the death rate in care homes has been running at three times its average and in April reached 26,000 people. But coronavirus was only blamed for 8,000 of the d those deaths. What is killing the rest? Jenny, do you want to answer, answer that? that? It probably goes back to the question before about how you count deaths. Uh, I don't think, I think what we're saying is 8,000 were confirmed linked with COVID. And actually what that means is they were associated with COVID. It doesn't, it's slightly different. What we, uh, those individuals had a diagnosis, they had a laboratory confirmation. Uh, they could have died from something else but had COVID or they could have died from COVID. And then the gap that you recognise, actually the same applies, but we don't have a test for those individuals. Some of them may well have had COVID. Some of them may well have died from other uh, issues. And that's why it's so important that we look at this whole excess mortality. It's very likely that some of those individuals uh, had COVID, uh, and that may apply to other parts of the population as well. Um, the important thing is whether they had appropriate care and treatment. Um, and uh, I think the other point is which you perhaps referring to is we are really mindful um, uh, as we go forward from a health perspective, as a health professional, to understand and ensure that people, wherever they are, whether it be care homes or the general public, continue to use emergency health services in the way that they should do. Um, and it's important that uh, people do consult them. So uh, we do know that there has been a drop in usage, for example, uh, of A&E, uh, uh, hospital admissions, for what are normally urgent issues. So there may be a proportion of individuals in there who have not accessed health services normally. It's why it's really important that we look at that total excess mortality over time. We encourage uh, care homes and the general population to use our health services normally where it's an emergency um, and that we continue to count uh, those cases where we can. Thanks very much, Ian. Our last question is from Derek Healy and Derek is from the Dundee Courier. Good afternoon, Derek. 
Hi there, thank you, Secretary of State. I'm sure you'll be aware of the concerns over what would happen in regards to the job retention scheme if Scotland, or indeed any other part of the UK, needs to remain in lockdown longer than England. Uh, it's been suggested the Scottish Government may not have sufficient borrowing powers to bankroll an extension itself. Um, so could you confirm, please, would you expect Treasury to continue funding the furlough uh, programme if people in Scotland need to stay off work for longer? Or is any other solution being looked at? And a question to the Deputy Chief Medical Officer as well, if I may. Uh, we've seen footage today of people returning to golf courses, garden centres and going back to work. And of course, we've seen the uh, measures you've just introduced in terms of moving home. Presumably modelling has been done on what that easing of restrictions would do in terms of the R number. Um, are you able to say specifically, possibly in terms of a number, what kind of an impact you would expect on the transmission rate from those changes introduced today? Thanks, Derek. Well, with respect to the uh, job retention scheme, which has been um, hugely uh, successful in keeping people in work, retaining the essential link between employees and employers, uh, the Chancellor has announced that we're going to be extending that for four months until October, and it will remain in its current form until the end of July. So that gives a lot of um, advance notice and guidance to employers and uh, employees who depend on it in all parts of the United Kingdom. It's a national scheme, and it's right that it uh, remains so. But the Chancellor and his officials in the Treasury will keep on engaging with the devolved administrations and with trades unions and businesses in all parts of the union, including in Scotland and, and no doubt in Dundee, so that as changes are made in time to the scheme, they reflect the needs of the economy and of working people throughout the UK. Jenny. Thank you. Um, so I, I think the quickest answer to, uh, to your question is to say that uh, interventions which are uh, being eased uh, or, or uh, leisure's activity, for example, that's being eased is designed to do so so that it uh, keeps the R under one. Uh, I think that goes without saying. It's extremely difficult to model uh, all of these different interventions at one time. Uh, and so, for example, we know that outdoor activity uh, is a, a much lower risk than being in enclosed spaces. And that's why you'll see the predominant freedoms are, are around that, while still reinforcing the fact that people need to practice good respiratory hygiene, wash their hands, uh, and keep two metres apart. So what the modellers do, will build a model around social interactions, which as far as possible uh, can predict some of these movements. Now, we can't say in advance how many people might want to move house or how many people are going to turn up on a golf course, but you can make some sensible estimates of that. Uh, but it's a two-part process. So you do an estimate uh, and then you will check what's happening to the R number. And so I think uh, many uh, people who've stood here before from the scientific side have said we need to watch both of those and tap back down some of these interventions and tighten them up if we see the R number going up. Uh, if people continue to practice that good social distancing, uh, then it should be possible to keep them all uh, under, under R. And I think, uh, I know we've had a lot of conversation on, on care homes, hospitals these days, but actually the community, the population, are doing really well at keeping uh, those uh, distancing measures in place. And if we continue to do that, then these are very, uh, they're the phase one, they're very low risk interventions. Great, thanks Jenny. Do you follow up, Derek, in closing? Uh, yes, please. Um, yeah, just to come back again, Mr. Jenrick, uh, businesses will fear there's going to be a cliff edge um, a few months down the line. Are you able to offer them any specific assurances um, that something will be in place here to look after them? Well, there isn't a cliff edge. The Chancellor has extended the scheme now for four months precisely to give people as much notice as possible and ensure that that doesn't happen. Because the scheme is so important, because it is helping so many people to stay in work and to stay in contact with their employers. So if the economy uh, bounces back, we can ensure that they return to their workplaces. The task for the Chancellor and the government is to ensure that we keep on engaging with businesses in all parts of the country, including the specific sectors um, in Dundee and in Scotland, so that the views of businesses and of working people in Scotland are heard as the Chancellor takes the next steps. Uh, in the months to come, and you can be assured that he will be doing that. Thank you very much, Derek.
Well, that concludes uh, this afternoon's press conference from Downing Street. Thank you very much indeed for watching.